acquisition of vocabulary. Fever and neutropenia. When did it start? I was reading and it felt so bad. Fever and neutropenia. Okay, why don't you lie down? I'll page Jason. He's on call tonight. I'll get him to give you some meds. I'm glad I was here on night. Worry, it'll be all right. Bang, how are you feeling? My teeth are chattering. Vitals. Temp 39.4, pulse 120, respiration 36, chills and sweating. Fever and neutropenia. It's a shake and bake. Blood cultures and urine stat. Prepare for reverse isolation. Start with acetaminophen, vitals every four hours. Jason? I think you need to talk to Kalekian about lowering the dose for the next cycle. It's too much for her like this. Lower the dose? No way. Full dose. She's tough. She can take it. Wake me when the counts come back from the lab. Dr. Barry, good morning. Fifth cycle, full dose, definite progress. Everything okay? Yes. You're doing swell. Isolation is no problem. A couple of days. Think of it as a vacation. Oh. Jason. Oh, jeez. Okay, okay. <laughs> In isolation, I am isolated. For once, I can use the term literally. The chemotherapeutic agents eradicating my cancer have also eradicated my immune system. In my present condition, every living thing is a health hazard to me. I really have not got time for this. Particularly healthcare professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Just to check the eye out for one minute, and it takes me a half hour to get the God. Four, seven, eleven, two, fifty, twice. Okay. Yeah. Jeez, clinical. Professor Baring, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Fine, just shaking sometimes when it chills. Ivy should kick in any time now, no problem. Listen, gotta go. Keep pushing the fluids. I am not in isolation because I have cancer. Because I have a tumor the size of a grapefruit. No. I am in isolation because I am being treated for cancer. My treatment imperils my health. <laughs> Herein lies the paradox. John Donne would revel in it. I would revel in it if he wrote a poem about it. My students would flounder in it because paradox is too difficult to understand. <laughs> Think of it as a puzzle, I would tell them. An intellectual game, or I would have told them. Word game, which it is not. If they were here, if I were lecturing, how I would perplex them. Every ambiguity, every shifting awareness, I could draw so much from the poems. I could be so powerful. The poetry of the early 17th century, what has been called the metaphysical school, considers an intractable mental puzzle by exercising the outstanding human faculty of the era namely wit. The most famous wit is John Donne. In the Holy Sonnets, Donne applied his capacious, agile wit to the larger aspects of the human experience, life, death, and God. In his poems, metaphysical quandaries are addressed, but never resolved. <clears throat> if poisonous minerals, and if that tree, whose fruit through death on else immortal us, if lecherous goats, if serpents envious, cannot be damned, alas, why should I be? Why should intent or reason, born in me, make sins in me else equal more heinous? And mercy being easy and glorious to God, in his stern wrath why threatens he? But who am I that dare dispute with thee? O oh God, O oh, of thine only worthy blood, and my tears make a heavenly Lethean flood, and 
drown in it my sin's black memory. That thou remember them, some claim as debt. I think it mercy if thou wilt forget. Dunn's Holy Sonnet, 5, 1609, from the Ashford edition based on Gardner. The speaker of the sonnet has a brilliant mind, and he plays his part convincingly. But in the end, he finds God's forgiveness hard to believe, so he crawls under a rock to hide. If arsenic and serpents are not damned, then why is he? In asking the question, the speaker turns eternal damnation into an intellectual game. Why would God choose to do what is hard to condemn, rather than what is easy and also glorious to show mercy? The argument shifts from cleverness to melodrama, an unconvincing eruption of piety. Oh, God, oh, a typical prayer would plead. Remember me, O oh Lord. The point is nicely explicated in an article by Richard Stryer, a former student of mine who once sat where you do now, although I dare say he was awake, <laughs> in the May 1989 edition of Modern Philology. When the speaker considers his own sins and the inevitability of God's judgment, he can conceive of but one resolution, to disappear. The speaker does not need to hide from God's judgment, only to accept God's forgiveness. We want to correct the speaker, to remind him of the assurance of salvation, but it is too late. The poetic encounter is over. We are left to our own consciences. Have we outwitted Dunn? Or have we been outwitted? Miss Barron. Will the poet. Miss Barron. <laughs> what is it? You have to go down for another test. Jason just called. They want another ultrasound. They're concerned about a bowel obstruction. No, not now. I'm sorry, but they want for it to be now. Not right now. It's not supposed to be now. They need for it to be now. It's not supposed to be now. I have this planned for now, not ultrasound. <laughs> no more tests. We've covered that. I know. I know, but it won't take long, and it isn't a long procedure. Why don't you just come along? I do not want to go now! Miss Baring. <coughs> Name. Baring. B-E-A-R-I-N-G. Collecting. It'll just be a minute. Time for your break? Yep. Take a break. <laughs> I don't mean to complain, but I am becoming very sick. Very, very sick. Ultimately sick, as it were. In everything I have done, I have been steadfast, resolute. Some would say in the extreme. Now, as you can see, I am distinguishing myself in illness. My next line is supposed to be something like, it is such a relief to get back to my room after those infernal tests. This is hardly true. It would be a relief to be a cheerleader on her way to Daytona Beach for spring break. Getting back to my room after those infernal tests is just the next thing that happens. Oh God, it is such a relief to get back to my goddamn room after those goddamn tests. Professor Bang, 